The world around us is a fascinating place, and it is not confined to our planet. What we see around is just a tiny part of the entire cosmos, and to date, terrestrial spacecraft have been able to reach only as far as the limits of the solar system. I invite you to set out on a journey which will start with the Voyager's trajectories, continue around the closest stars, and end in the infinite depths of our universe. Our trip is going to be swift, absorbing, and really enthralling. Please make yourselves comfortable, and let's begin. It's the pictures taken by Voyager 2 that allowed scientists to be able to see one of the most controversial bodies in the solar system. Miranda, Uranus a satellite. The subject of big space travel was first broached in 1966. Gary Flandreau, still a student, published a scientific paper where he predicted the orbits of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune getting closer together by the late 1970s. The predictions proved to be accurate, and on the 10th of March 1982, a full planetary parade took place. The eight planets of the solar system and Pluto were on the same side of the sun at an angle of 95 degrees. The rendezvous of the giant planets provided opportunities for using gravitational maneuvering to fly the two probes on trajectories. Jupiter, Saturn, Pluto, and Jupiter, Uranus, Neptune. 10,000 possible trajectories were considered when the program was being worked out before the two final ones were agreed upon. Apart from exploring the furthest objects of the solar system, the Voyagers have taken a great number of photos of our own planet, including one of the most well-known ones from a record distance of almost 6 billion kilometers. The idea of the picture, as well as its name, the pale blue dot, belongs to a prominent astrophysicist of the 20th century and an outstanding popularizer of science, Carl Sagan. The scientists didn't rule out the possibility of the Voyagers encountering extraterrestrial beings. That is why both spacecraft carried a gold-plated audio-visual disc with greetings in 55 different languages, significant scientific data, views of the Earth, and its position in relation to its 14 pulsars. Music holds a special place in the message to intelligent aliens. The collection of music includes classical works by Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, pieces by Louis Armstrong and Chuck Berry, as well as folk music from around the world. The record also contains instructions on how to access the data on its back. However, let us not dwell on the past but look at the future of the Voyager project. Where are the spacecraft now, and what awaits these solitary space wanderers? The Voyager's chief mission of exploring the furthest planets in the solar system was completed long ago. Now, the main objective of both probes is studying the transitional areas between the Sun and interstellar plasma. The Voyagers travel at 17.07 km per second and 15.64 km per second, respectively. At the moment this video is posted, the distance between the Earth and Voyager 1 is approximately 21.7 billion kilometers while Voyager 2 is 17.9 billion kilometers away from us. The spacecraft's missions differ in their trajectories. Voyager 1 flew only by Jupiter and Saturn, while Voyager 2 went further and flew by Uranus and Neptune as well. That is the reason why Voyager 2 is never going to catch up with its twin brother. In 2012, Voyager 1 left the heliosphere boundaries to cross into interstellar space. It follows a hyperbolic trajectory, so Voyager 1 is not going to return to the solar system. Due to the gravitational force of the latter, its twin overcame the heliopause only in November 2018. Leaving the heliosphere does not actually mean leaving the solar system. To do this, one has to go as far as the Oort Cloud, a hypothetical region of the solar system and a place of birth of ice comets. Only there will the gravitational force of our star become negligibly feeble. The Voyagers are powered by plutonium-238 radioisotope thermoelectric generators. After 42 years, the power of the probes went down to 55 and is now 249 watts, as opposed to 470 watts at the beginning of the mission. Time of launch, this does not allow full application of the probe's scientific equipment. Only 5 out of 10 devices are operating. Now the cosmic ray system, the low-energy charged particle instrument, the magnetometer, the plasma wave subsystem, and the plasma instrument. Now, the Voyager mission members are struggling to maintain the equipment's operation. According to preliminary estimates, the minimal energy generation required for scientific studies will be sustained till 2025. 
This time is hoped to be sufficient to explore interstellar space, in particular, the structure of the heliopause. In the future, the data may be used in planning missions to the stellar system closest the to us. The probes will switch into a radio beacon mode and will transmit the last signal to the Earth in 2036. Thus, the life expectancy of the voyagers will reach about 59 years. One must admit it is quite a period for a space trip. In about 300 years, Voyager 2 is going to reach the inner edge of the Oort cloud and will completely leave it only in 30,000 years. According to the data provided by the Hubble telescope, it will take Voyager 2 approximately 2,000 years to cross the gas cloud in which the solar system floats. It will take the probe about 90,000 years to get into other interstellar clouds. The remains of the Voyagers are presumed to reach stars as well. In about 40,000 years, Voyager 1 is supposed to pass Gliese 445 as a star in Camilla Pardalis within a 1.6 light years distance. Meanwhile, its twin will approach Ross 248 as a star in Andromeda at a 1.7 light years distance. In 290,000 years, Voyager 2 will fly by Sirius at a 4.3 light years distance. Life sustaining planets are unlikely to exist in the vicinity of either Ross 248 or Gliese 445. Both of them are red dwarfs, each of them hardly half the mass of the Sun. Ross 248 is notable for being a flare star, that is, one that spontaneously flares up at about the time Voyager 2 approaches Ross 248 closest. The closest star to the Sun will, for a short time, be Ross 248 and not Proxima Centauri. The Voyagers are to remain eternal wanderers in the universe. They won't be able to leave the Milky Way and are destined to wander around our galaxy. They have lived through scores of failures on their journey, but in spite of that, they continue to operate, transmitting important scientific data to the Earth. With the initially planned five-year lifespan, they're pushing their fourth decade of service. As far as I'm concerned, the Voyager project is the most successful idea in the history of space exploration. The data received during the mission have changed man's perception of the solar system. It is hard to tell whether an extraterrestrial race will ever read the message on the golden-plated disks on the Voyagers. Since the solar system is 15 times faster than the Voyagers, it's circling around the galaxy center. It is possible that our planet will recapture the remains of the probes in some hundreds of millions of years. Maybe the message aimed at aliens will eventually be a greeting from a distant past to the human race of the future. Man's life has changed significantly when we learned to use optical devices for research. 410 years have passed since the time when Galileo Galilei pointed a three-power spyglass at the moon and just 29 years since the launch of Hubble, the first space observatory. Today, the distance to the edge of the observable universe equals approximately 14 billion parsecs, and this may well be called just the beginning of our exploration. It is interplanetary space probes that are going to herald the next stage. The most famous ones, like the Voyagers or New Horizons, are known worldwide, but among spacecraft like these, there are veterans as well. One of them is the Cassini Interplanetary Orbiter, which started its mission back in 1997 and completed it quite recently. What did the spacecraft discover? And what did it get to observe in the 20 years of its historic mission? Originally, the Cassini project implied exploring Saturn and its satellites and delivering the Huygens lander to Titan. The project was made real by the efforts of several organizations, including NASA, ESA, the Italian Space Agency, and others. About 260 scientists from 17 countries were involved in the project. The Huygens lander was created by the European Space Agency, with a systems section produced by Lockheed Martin specialists. One of NASA's departments was in charge of the flight. The initial weight of the spacecraft was 5 tons, 719 kilos. Its height was 6.7 meters, and its width, 4 meters. The 320-kilogram probe, 336-kilogram scientific instruments, and 3,310-kilogram 3 fuel all added to the impressive weight of the spacecraft. Cassini was powered by radioisotope thermoelectric generators using radioactive plutonium-238 for fuel. Also, the spacecraft had 12 scientific instruments on board, 
among them a mass spectrometer and ultraviolet radar, a magnetometer, and others. The spacecraft was launched on October 15, 1997, from Cape Canaveral. In order to gain the desired speed, the spacecraft was initially flown in the opposite direction from Saturn and passed Venus twice. Then, in August 1999, Cassini flew by the Earth at a speed of 69,000 kilometers per hour. It used the opportunity to test After its this, cameras. The biggest plan of the solar system was awaiting it, Jupiter, which was passed by the spacecraft on December 30, 2000. Cassini managed to take quite a number of pictures of this planet, as well as a few of its satellites, thus providing a substantial amount of scientific data, including Jupiter's atmospheric circulation. As soon as on June 30, 2004, the spacecraft reached Saturn and achieved its final goal by becoming the planet's first artificial satellite. It was coasting at the orbital speed of 15 kilometers per second. The Huygens probe on board the Cassini spacecraft was supposed to take it from there. On December 25, 2004, Huygens detached itself to set out on its deliberate way to the surface of Titan. Even before Cassini entered into orbit around Saturn on January 14, 2005, the probe penetrated the atmosphere of the mysterious satellite. It touched down on a hard surface two and a half hours later. In the following 72 minutes, Cassini received signals from the probe on Titan's surface and beamed back 350 images to Earth. Thanks to the data received, it became known that there were not only rivers and lakes on Titan, but also rounded hydrocarbon pebbles and methane clouds. Cassini undertook further exploration of the satellite over a period of 13 years. It flew by Saturn's largest satellite over a hundred times and stumbled upon a great number of discoveries. The most fascinating of them was that islands on Titan's lakes submerged and re-emerged. However, the precise mechanism of this phenomenon remains to be found out. During the time Cassini was operating, astronomers from Earth discovered seven new Saturn satellites thanks to the pictures transmitted from the spacecraft. With the very first discoveries made during the time Castini was approaching Saturn, Saturn's new moons were dubbed Paulini, Polyduces, and Methone. While Castini remained in Saturn's orbit, there were discovered satellites later named Daphnis, Anthe, Aegean, and the curious satellite S-2009-S1, which hasn't been given a name yet. This satellite is the closest to its planet. Speaking about the most impressive discoveries made by Cassini, two fascinating phenomena may be singled out. These are the swirling of Saturn's atmosphere and an exciting hexagonal jet stream with a red hurricane inside. Soon after Cassini's discovery of this mysterious hexagon, another unaccountable property of the vortex was registered by astronomers. With passing years, the vortex changed its color. The area of this hurricane is 50 times that of the average hurricane on Earth. The next objective for exploration was Saturn's rings. It should be noted that some of them, like the Anthe Arc or the Pallini Ring, were discovered by Cassini itself. A number of finite details were revealed by Cassini as it observed the rings. For example, how sharpened satellites like Daphnis kept Cliff's watch on the rings and how a nice belt built up on them. It was also thanks to the Cassini mission that it became known that there is a water ocean under the crust of Enceladus just like under the crust of some of Jupiter's satellites. This ocean might have the correct chemistry for sustaining life, but unlike Europa or Ganymede, before the spacecraft was launched, only 18 of Saturn's satellites were known to scientists. In the seven years Cassini was traveling to Saturn, 13 more satellites were spotted, and during the spacecraft's operation, 22 more satellites were discovered, seven of which directly thanks to Cassini's pictures. Today, we know 82 satellites of this planet. 20 of them were discovered quite recently. This makes Saturn the richest planet and satellites in the solar system. At the end of its mission, Cassini discovered yet another surprising phenomenon, a space between Saturn's rings. Just before the mission's grand finale, the spacecraft positioned itself between rings, and instead of expected dust forests, it observed just an absolutely empty space. Cassini's fate was sealed in May 2017 due to the lack of fuel. Any further operation of the spacecraft in orbit was no longer possible. The mission's management considered 19 options of the probe's destiny, 
One of them involves steering into orbit around the sun or of one of Saturn's satellites. But in the end, it was decided to let Cassini burn up in the gas giant's atmosphere. The decision was supposed to prevent the potential the biological of contamination. April 2017, Cassini performed a maneuver around Titan and found itself between Saturn and its closest ring. The spacecraft kept taking pictures until the very end. This is what its last photo being back to the Earth looked like. On entering the planet's atmosphere, the spacecraft pointed its aerial to the Earth and began transmitting data about the chemistry of Saturn's atmosphere. Soon after, the connection with the orbiter was lost. It burned up in the dense strata of Saturn's atmosphere. Even though the Cassini mission wasn't as tremendous as missions to Mars, it proved extremely useful to contemporary astronomy. The spacecraft brought scientists up to speed with truly unique images on a monthly basis. Thanks to these, many aspiring astronomers built their careers using this database. The result of the mission indeed surpassed all expectations because today we can realistically talk about discovering life on Saturnian satellites. Perhaps we will soon find out about these discoveries, and then it will be perfectly clear who to give credit for this. Voyager 2 would never have made any of its discoveries had it not been for something that happened in the 1960s that revolutionized our today's perception of celestial bodies. In 1964, when Gary Flandro, then an intern at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, started drawing graphs of planets' future positions, he soon found that all the planets beyond the asteroid belt were going to align in a very narrow sector of the sky. In the late 1970s in our system, this phenomenon occurs once every 175 years, and this was a unique opportunity. By performing gravity boost maneuvers, a spacecraft would be able to whiz from one planet to another, thus exploring them all. It would also reduce the time of the flight, which would greatly boost chances of success. However, due to potentially high costs, this ambitious project had to be rejected. That's why NASA came up with something different. In 1977, a cheaper project was planned, namely Mariner Jupiter Saturn 77. Even though the two probes were intended to explore exclusively Jupiter and Saturn, the scientists in charge of their development designed the probes in a way for them to be ready for a prolonged journey. The first probe's trajectory allowed it to additionally pass Titan, one of Saturn's moons with its own atmosphere. As for the second spacecraft, it was able to fly by Uranus and Neptune. Half a year before the planned launch, it was decided to change the project's name. Thus, the Voyagers made their appearance in the history of space discoveries. Running ahead, it should be mentioned that in their long history, the Voyagers have discovered a number of phenomena whose existence was to be confirmed only many years later. Jupiter's tumultuous atmosphere, Saturn's changeable rings, and Neptune's dark spot. All these discoveries were made possible thanks to the ambitious experiment NASA scientists ventured to carry out. Nine years after its launch, Voyager 2 became the only spacecraft to ever reach Uranus. In order to boost up its connection with the Earth, a 64-meter DSN antenna and two 24-meter antennas were set up back on our planet. The spacecraft's cameras were supposed to be able to beam back several thousand pictures. Things we already knew about Uranus before the Voyager's approach. Its rotation angle, nine rings, and five of its satellites comprise a tiny portion of the information that has been made available today, thanks to that single swift flyby. On June 7, 1985, the first navigation pictures of Uranus system were taken, but it was not until November 6 that the camera moved on to taking more detailed images. It is quite extraordinary that the magnetometers kept silent in November, December, and even the first half of January. At the same time, the Earth radiation meter quietened down only after the orbit of Mars while Jupiter's radio emissions persisted from the very day of the launch. Michael Kaiser from the Goddard Space Flight Center prophetically remarked, It's either that we've encountered a planet without a magnetic field, or else it's so bizarre that we don't know what to look for. Thanks to the Voyager's investigations, it is now known that Uranus' magnetic field has some features. Due to its peculiar rotation, the magnetic dipole does not coincide with the planet's rotation axis. It is in fact displaced by one-third of its radius relating to its center. Besides, the magnetic axis is tilted with respect to the rotation axis at an angle of 60 degrees. Uranus' magnetosphere doesn't look like a wide stripe. 
but is rather lopsided due to the strong tilt of the rotation axis to the magnetic axis. On December 27, 1985, Uranus latitudinal zones were clearly visible in the transmitted images. On the same dark day, brown at the poles thanks to the snapshots, Stephen Sinnott was able to confirm the discovery of Uranus's first unknown satellite, 1985 U1, which was traditionally dubbed after a character from a play by William Shakespeare, 15 Puck. In the following several days, Voyager 2 carried on taking pictures of the moons. Among them, already known were Titania, Oberon, Ariel, Umbriel, and Miranda. However, their number grew thanks to the pictures. On January 16, 1986, the Voyager 2. The project team announced the discovery of six more moons with the help of the photos. The largest objects, 1986 U1 and U2 were discovered in the photos examined on January the 3rd. U3 was discovered on January the 9th, and U4, U5, and U6 were registered on the 13th of January. The temporary designations of Uranus satellites were substituted by these up-to-date names, 12 Portia, 11 Juliet, 9 Cressida, 13 Rosalind, 14 Belinda, and 10 Desdemona. In the images of January the 20th, some details of the relief on the surface of Oberon, Titania, and Dariel were distinguishable, and two more satellites were discovered on that day, U7 and U8. Six Cordelia and seven Ophelia were discovered on January the 22nd. Voyager 2 set off in its first flyby program V751 on that same day. In addition to taking regular snapshots of the moons, Voyager 2 captured the patchwork of the Uranian rings and umbrella in color. In one of the images taken on the following day, Bradford Smith found one more satellite, 1986 U9, which was later dubbed 8 Bianca. Miranda, or rather its peculiar terrain, was a discovery that amazed NASA's astrophysicists. It was possible to distinguish it thanks to the Voyager's pictures. The outer layer of Miranda's crust is covered with crevices, dales, cliffs, and ravines, which together form a hybrid of geological features from different worlds. According to explorers' estimates, at least 10 types of terrain find themselves on a celestial body of a measly 500 kilometers in diameter. After that, it was time to discover Uranian rings. When Voyager 2 was passing through the planet's ring plane, a great multitude of dusty particles were observed 115,000 kilometers away from the planet's core and 60,000 kilometers away from the outer ring epsilon. It looked like a diffuse nebula, 4,000 kilometers thick. Thus, two new Iranian rings were discovered by Voyager 2. The first ring was located between the Delta and Epsilon ones and was given the temporary designation 1986U1R. In direct sunlight, it looked very narrow, just about one or two kilometers, and faint. Only by using ultraviolet detectors were astronomers able to observe it. Later, Uranus' tenth ring was seen in the images. This picture shows all of them, from the bright Epsilon ring to the faint line of the sixth ring. The existence of the second ring discovered by Voyager 2, dubbed 1986U2R, was confirmed only in 2004. It was located 39,500 kilometers away from the planet's core, and within 20 years, it had migrated beyond, now finding itself within the distance of up to 41,350 kilometers away from the core. Before bidding farewell to Uranus and faring onward towards new horizons, Voyager 2 took its last snapshot of the planet. At the moment when this picture was taken, the probe was already a million kilometers away and was making for yet another mystery of the solar system, Neptune. This encounter would herald a major scientific breakthrough. At the same time, billions of kilometers away, thousands of people held their breath in anticipation of yet another step into the unknown. This was the famous Voyager 2 probe, which still remains the only apparatus to have flown by Neptune. Voyager 2 spent just a few months near the planet, but even in that short time span, it was able to gather a great amount of valuable information. Neptune was the last big object to be seen by Voyager 2 before the probe entered the heliopause boundaries and came into interstellar space. But what did the last shots from Neptune look like? Before you find out, let's look at the probe's history. 
On August the 20th, 1977, this is the day when Voyager 2 left the surface of the Earth. 41 years later, it was to go beyond the boundaries of the entire solar system. Initially, its mission implied only the exploration of Jupiter, Saturn, and their satellites, but the flight's trajectory presented the opportunity of flying by Uranus and Neptune as well. As soon as on July the 9th, 1979, Voyager 2 was 71,000 kilometers away from Jupiter. The probe also flew by its satellites Europa and Ganymede. The images received from the spacecraft gave grounds for putting forward the hypothesis of there being a liquid ocean under the crust of Europa. The observation of Ganymede showed that it was covered by a dirty ice crust. By the time two more years had elapsed, Voyager 2 was 100 by and 1,000 Tethys and Enceladus and transmitted detailed pictures of their surfaces. According to initial forecasts, that was supposed to be the end of its mission, but Voyager 2 continued on its course. On January 24, 1986, the spacecraft approached Uranus and passed it at a distance of 81,000 kilometers. Voyager 2 sent a number of photos to Earth, showcasing the planet's satellites, as well as its rings and surface. Thanks to these photos, two more rings of Uranus were discovered, and the nine already known rings were studied more closely. Two years later, Voyager 2 found itself in the vicinity of the furthest object of its mission and passed Neptune within 48,000 kilometers on August 24, 1989. It was able to capture unique photographs of Neptune and its largest satellite, Triton. Active geysers were discovered on Triton, which came as a big surprise considering its remote position and low temperature. After crossing the termination shock and entering the heliopause, Voyager 2 passed through this area as well to come into interstellar space, where it will remain. But what did the last planet seen by Voyager 2, Neptune, look like? Many would agree that Neptune is one of the most mysterious planets in the solar system. It is perceived as a huge blue planet, similar to Uranus in terms of composition, and has been classified as an icy giant. Neptune's atmosphere is mainly composed of hydrogen, helium, and methane, which gives it its blue color. The planet's diameter ranks fourth in the solar system, and its mass ranks third. Neptune is renowned for its extreme climate, with the strongest winds in the solar system, reaching speeds of up to 600 meters per second. These powerful winds would easily sweep away any object that landed on the planet's surface. The surface temperature of Neptune is close to minus 220 degrees Celsius. When Voyager 2 approached Neptune, it captured its first images from a distance of 310 million kilometers. As the probe got closer, the images revealed formations in Neptune's atmosphere, including a huge dark spot similar in size to Jupiter's great red spot. As Voyager 2 continued its approach, it was able to see the planet in color. The probe also captured images of Neptune's closest satellite, Triton, and the nebulae surrounding the planet. These pictures showed various cloud formations, including cirrus clouds that cast shadows on the layer of continuous clouds below. Voyager 2 also measured wind forces, reaching speeds of up to 700 meters per second in some areas. The closest distance of the probe's approach to the cloud layer of Neptune was 4,900 kilometers. After capturing these remarkable images, Voyager 2 bid its last farewell to Neptune and continued on its course. The last image taken by Voyager 2 near Neptune appears to be a final goodbye as it entered a shadow at that time, allowing only a partial view of the icy giant. It was approaching Neptune when the probe was 310 million kilometers away from the planet. As the probe got closer, the images revealed formations in Neptune's atmosphere. These three images were received at a 90-minute interval. The photos allowed scientists to see atmospheric clouds and a huge dark spot similar in size to the great red spot on Jupiter. It should be noted that this area on Neptune was 10% darker than the surrounding atmosphere. When Voyager 2 got even closer, it was able to capture color images of the planet from a distance of 176 million kilometers. These photos were taken five hours apart, during which time the planet had rotated 100 degrees. The probe's next objective was the closest satellite, Triton. On July 3, 1989, Voyager 2 captured a picture of Triton and Neptune in one image. 
The probe continued to get closer and took another series of pictures from 35 million kilometers away from Neptune to study the nebulae in more detail. In addition to the great dark spot, dozens of similar formations were observed in the contrasting image. Voyager 2 also captured images of thin and bright clouds, indicating that they floated higher than the great dark spot. The great dark spot completed almost a full turn around the planet in the span of 17 hours, revealing that these spots can move around Neptune at a speed of 100 meters per second. The images from Voyager 2 also allowed scientists to determine wind speeds, which reached up to 700 meters per second in some areas, nearly the speed of sound. The probe flew as close as 4,900 kilometers to the cloud layer of the planet, capturing images of service clouds casting shadows on the layer of Voyager 2 also took pictures of several satellites, including Triton and Nereid. Afterward, the probe continued on its course and bid its last farewell to the views of Neptune. The last image taken by Voyager 2 near Neptune appears as a goodbye, as it entered a shadow at the time, only partially revealing the icy giant. And thus, it marked the end of their short encounter. Acquaintance and Voyager 2 left those parts never to return again. Voyager 2 still remains the only spacecraft to have reached Uranus and Neptune. Its successful mission was outstripped only by that of the New Horizons Pro, which reached Pluto in July 2015. Voyager 2, however, will always remain a legend of space exploration. In about 300 years, it will reach the Oort cloud and sail beyond it. Only in 30,000 years, it is highly likely that by that time, more than one exploration mission to Neptune will have been launched. But the achievements of Voyager 2 can truly be called a worthy beginning of this story. Things concealed by the stars nearest to us will attract scientists, amateur astronomers, and science fiction writers from Earth for decades, if not centuries to come. Ways to gauge the magnitude of the universe differ from each other, but it is generally true to assume that the solar system stretches in all directions as far as one light year from the sun. Beyond that frontier, just a few light years away from Earth, there are the stars closest to us, the closest out of approximately 200 billion of those in the Milky Way. Every star is an exploding hydrogen ball resembling our sun, and each of them is unique. The sun, the basis of our system, is the closest star to Earth. Unlike other stars, it is clearly visible in broad daylight. As for other celestial bodies in the infinite space, they can be seen in the nighttime. However, stars differ in terms of their real brightness. Scientists have defined the closest celestial bodies within the radius of 16 light years. 57 stellar systems have been pinpointed, but only seven of them can be seen in the sky without any optical assistance. These are Sirius, Alpha Centauri, Epsilon Eridani, Ta Ceti, and 61 Cygni. Some of them are not just solitary bodies, but binary or triple stars. So the overall number of these celestial bodies reaches 64. Thirteen brown dwarf stars are also included in the list. They are considerably lighter than the other bodies. Proxima Centauri is our closest neighbor of all, which is 500 times less bright than the sun. It is one of those secretive ones that are invisible to the naked eye. That could be the reason why this object was discovered only in 1915. It is the third and actually smallest stellar component in the Alpha Centauri system. In contrast to the Sun, which finds its way around the galaxy on its own, Proxima Centauri is locked in its orbit, stretching for one million years around the two other stars. This couple, known as Alpha Centauri A and B, is perceived as one star by the observer on Earth who isn't employing telescopes or binoculars. Besides, it is one of the brightest systems in the sky. Both stars in the system resemble the Sun much more than Proxima itself. Proxima's color is completely different from that of the Sun because this star is much colder 2700 degrees Celsius as opposed to 5500 degrees on the Sun. Alpha Centauri A is one and a half times brighter than the Sun and their surface temperature is almost identical. In contrast, Alpha Centauri B is two times weaker than the Sun and about 500 degrees colder. Interestingly, in August 2016, Scientists announced the discovery of a planet the size of the Earth going around Proxima Centauri. This new object, known as Proxima b, is about 1.3 Earth masses, which, according to scientists, 
may mean that this exoplanet is a rocky world. Its location in relation to the star makes it habitable. It is the correct distance away from the star for water to accumulate on its surface. Proxima is 7.5 million kilometers away from its star, and it is likely that it's blocked, that is, it faces the star with one side only, just like the moon which shows the Earth only one of its parts. By the same token, it's worth mentioning that, according to scientific estimates, it would take a spaceship from Earth about 70,000 years to reach Proxima Centauri. However, with the data received with modern telescopes, it is still not clear whether Proxima B may be habitable. Speaking about the next of our closest stars, it's another red dwarf, Barnard's star, However, which unfortunately is the fourth nearest star after Proxima Centauri and before land, and is located in a completely different direction, namely in the constellation of Ophiuchus and 1.7 light years further than Proxima. This little star is considerably smaller than the Sun, being only 0.17 of its mass and diameter. In fact, it was discovered comparatively recently, even though it's the fastest moving star in the sky, crossing the distance equal to the diameter of the full moon in 180 years. The flying Barnard is notable for its rapidity of movement. It moves towards the Sun, and eventually, it is going to be closer to us than Proxima Centauri. The color of the star is the direct indicator of the temperature on its surface. Just like a metal rod which, when heated, first turns red, then orange, after that yellow, then white, and finally blue. For decades, Californian scientists have been making great efforts to discover planets in the vicinity of Barnard's star, but so far there are no data as to their existence. Here is another cluster of brown dwarfs, the constellation of Veller or Sails, located in the southern hemisphere. This constellation is our second closest star after the Sun. Interestingly, it is difficult to observe from the territory of Eurasia. You can see only part of it in the southern regions of Russia, and the further south you are, the higher the chances to observe the constellation. By the way, the best conditions for observing at least some parts of it are in February. Speaking about the stars of this constellation, the brightest one should be mentioned first. Gamma Velorum, it is also nicknamed the spectral gem of southern skies for its rays which boast incredibly bright emission lines, as opposed to dark absorption lines which are generally more common. That is the reason for the rather exotic spectrum of the gamma star at 800 light years away from us. This star is the second largest in the constellation and is made up of at least six components. Also, Gamma 2 Velorum is generally considered rather bright. It includes several stars, one of which belongs to the wolf rate set of stars. But these aren't all the massive bodies in the Veller constellation. For example, the mass of the Lumen 16 system is 30 Jupiter masses. With its brightness flaring up and fading from time to time, it is almost seven light years away from us. At the same time, the mass of another component of Lumen 16 equals 50 Jupiter masses. This binary stellar system was discovered comparatively recently in 2013 while no celestial bodies or exoplanets have been discovered in its vicinity. Most people perceive it as one single star. However, in reality, Sirius is a binary stellar system consisting of two space objects. Sirius A and Sirius B, both stars orbit around their common gravity center at a distance of approximately 20 astronomical units. Just to compare, this is only one astronomical unit more than the distance from Uranus to the Sun. Their orbital period around the gravity center is 50 years. Sirius A is the main component. It is a visible star of spectral type O1, which has long been perceived as the only star in the system. It is about two sun masses, with the radius exceeding that of the sun by 71%. Due to its close proximity, Sirius A is one of the easiest objects for amateur astronomers. The star is 8.6 light years away from our system, and its brightness is 25 times as intense as that of the Sun. In addition to its superiority over our main star in terms of its dimensions and mass, this celestial object also beats it in the temperature level, which may reach 9940 kelvins on its surface, as opposed to only 5778 kelvins on the Sun. The most exciting peculiarity of the object is a high level of iron in its atmosphere, which is 316% as abundant as on the Sun. Also, the spectrum shows that other elements heavier than helium are to be found. 
The star is likely to have been enriched in metallic Sirius, elements. Uh, tens a neighboring of star of system years. is likely to continue existing as it is for another 600 million years. However, after that time, it will undergo a transformation from a red giant to a white dwarf. Currently, only a few thousand white dwarfs are known to science, primarily because of their low luminosity and small diameter. Nonetheless, scientists estimate that there are approximately 10 billion white dwarfs in our galaxy, accounting for about 5% of all stars in the Milky Way. The second component of the Sirius stellar system is one such white dwarf. It was the first white dwarf to be discovered back in 1844 by the renowned German astronomer Friedrich Bessel. Bessel noticed that the trajectory of Sirius occasionally deviated from its expected linear motion, leading him to hypothesize the presence of a hidden mass orbiting together with the star. This hypothesis was met with skepticism, as it implied that the mass of the unseen satellite was equal to that of our Sun. However, 18 years later in January 1862, Bessel's assumptions were proven correct when the American astronomer Alvin Graham Clark observed a tiny star near Sirius, following the predicted orbital movement. This star became known as Sirius B. Sirius B, the heaviest known white dwarf, has a mass approximately equal to that of the Sun, but occupies a volume less than one millionth that of the Sun. Before becoming a white dwarf, it is believed that Sirius B underwent two key stages of star evolution, the main sequence stage and the red giant stage. Scientists estimate that the transformation into a white dwarf occurred approximately 120 million years ago when Sirius B had a mass five times that of the Sun. Currently, Sirius B emits very little light, with a luminosity just 0, 0 0.026 times that of the Sun, despite having an exceptionally high surface temperature of 25,200 kelvins. Over the course of billions of years, Sirius B will gradually cool off and eventually become a hypothetical black dwarf. However, scientists have yet to observe this type of object. Unlike its brighter companion, Sirius B is not easily observable in the sky, which resulted in it being inadvertently overlooked by science for a long time. It wasn't until October 15, 2003, that scientists obtained a clearer image of Sirius B with the help of the Hubble telescope. Both stars, Sirius A and Sirius B, are visible in this image. Sirius is located in the well-known constellation Canis Major, visible to the naked eye in both the northern and southern hemispheres. Throughout history, Sirius has been the subject of myth and legend, known by various names in different cultures. In ancient Egypt, it was referred to as the Nile Star and associated with the goddess Sopdit as its early morning appearance preceded the flooding of the Nile River during the summer solstice. Sirius is mentioned in the works of Roman scientists Seneca and Ptolemy, who described it as a scarlet star. It also holds significance in the histories of Mesopotamian and Chinese astronomy, and is sometimes referred to as a bright red star. These conflicting descriptions have led to various pseudoscientific theories about Sirius. The temporary reddening of Sirius could be explained by the presence of interstellar dust, which intermittently obstructs the star's radiance and gives it a reddish hue. Another possibility is the existence of a third component in the Sirius system with an orbital period of roughly 2,000 years. When this hypothetical object comes close to Sirius A, uh, it could cause the star to appear redder. However, thus far, no object resembling this hypothetical third component has been discovered. In April 2018, NASA launched the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite TSS, with the goal of discovering exoplanets orbiting bright stars. While it is unlikely that any planets will be found in the vicinity of Sirius due to its young age, the satellite will continue to search for exoplanets and other star systems. Collect data that will facilitate its investigation in more detail. Even if there is at least one big planet in this system, life cannot be sustained there as too little time has passed since the formation of the star itself. Apart from that, any planets within the habitable zone must have been burned out when Sirius B was in its red dwarf stage, and as a result, there is as good as no chance of discovering any life forms in this system. Sirius is likely to be a relatively young system according to modern estimates. Its age is gauged as being between 200 to 300 million years. 
Procyon is the closest star to Sirius, being fifth place on this list, although this may well change in the future. The point is that Sirius approaches our system at the speed of 7.6 kilometers per second, which is why its brightness visible to us is going to gradually decrease. Sirius will remain the brightest star in our sky for thousands of years to come, after which the process is supposed to be reversed with the star growing ever dimmer to the observer on our Earth. In our modern age, some may think astronomy to be a young science, as most discoveries are being made with the use of state-of-the-art equipment. However, the movements of celestial bodies have been studied throughout the entire history of mankind, and the star Sirius is a perfect confirmation of this. The statement that there are boundaries to the universe is considered per se, one of those great ideas which are able to dramatically change our world perception. Something similar took place back in 1543 when Nicholas Copernicus proved that the Earth wasn't located in the center of the cosmos. The following breakthrough took place in the 20th century when Edwin Hubble showed the world that galaxies moved away from each other. This prompted the idea that the universe hasn't existed eternally and was formed as a result of a certain event. The Big Bang Today we are certain that the dimensions of the world we live in are much larger than we are capable of imagining. The search for the answer to the question about its boundaries is going to lead to yet another scientific breakthrough. At the moment, scientists are able to talk only of the boundaries within which the objects are visible. This area is also called the observable universe, that is, its part which is the absolute past in relation to the observer. The cosmic horizon is the boundary of the observable universe. The objects on the horizon become infinitely red-shifted, that is, they constantly move further away. The number of galaxies within the observable universe is estimated at upwards of 500 billion, with this number increasing on a regular basis as the research equipment becomes more advanced. But how big is the observable area of the universe today? The distance to the remotest observable objects equals approximately 14 billion parsecs in all directions. Thus, the observable universe is a sphere with a diameter of about 93 billion light years and with the center inside the solar system. That is, it is centered on the observer. The area equals 305 quinvigintillion cubic meters. It should be mentioned that the light emitted by the furthest observable objects has been traveling for 13.8 billion light years before reaching us. However, the distance to those objects has significantly grown due to the never ceasing expansion of the universe. This process is the result of there being matter and energy in space, filling space-time. All there is matter in space, there is gravitational force. Therefore, the universe either shrinks, affected by gravity, or expands, affected by dark energy. It is also worth noting. Noting that there isn't a single center for the universe's expansion, just like there isn't a space for the universe to expand into beyond its boundaries, this process takes place with the matter in space at any point, everywhere and at all times. We do not physically perceive this as the force holding our atoms and molecules together does not allow us to burst under the influence of the space expansion. This may be compared to a baking loaf of bread with the raisins for galaxies in similar formations and the dough for the space matter. According to estimates, the distance to the furthermost observable objects today equals approximately 14 gigaparsecs or 46 billion light years the furthermost stellar system with respect to the Earth is a galaxy dubbed GNZ11. Its light has been traveling to us for about 13.4 billion years, meaning that this object was formed less than 400 million years after the Big Bang. However, due to the constant expansion of the universe, today's distance to GNZ11 is approximately 32 billion light years. One may argue that the speed with which it recedes exceeds the speed of light, but it does not clash with the special theory of relativity, as it isn't the matter that is receding, but the space between the two objects is growing larger. This object is supposedly one of the very first galaxies and is likely to be the closest stellar cluster to the edge of the observable universe. If man were able to freely travel from one world to another, it is in that galaxy that we might we find out about the, the galaxy is likely to have started to expand immediately on its birth. In theory, the boundaries of the meta-galaxy may well reach the cosmic singularity. That is, it may show us what the world had been like before the Big Bang. But in practice, it is relic radiation that is the limit to the observable. 
This radiation is emitted by the furthest object in the universe to have been observed in contemporary science. This radiation poses something like a barrier for our vision. It came about approximately 380,000 years after the Big Bang, that is, at the time when the universe cooled off sufficiently for atoms to emerge. In plain English, it is similar to an image of space in its childhood, where it is depicted before the formation of the first stars. It is likely that the universe stretches infinitely beyond this barrier, and it is there that its hypothetical boundaries are to be found. The objects beyond this barrier are referred to in a number of ways, multiverse objects, parallel universe objects, to name a few. Science today is incapable of defining these bodies with any detail. However, assuming that the universe carries on expanding, we may conclude that the objects we're able to observe now are sooner or later going to disappear from our field of vision. If the accelerating expansion of the universe continues indefinitely, the galaxies beyond our supercluster are sooner or later going to recede beyond the horizon, becoming invisible to us. Any form of communication beyond the boundaries of the observable universe will be rendered impossible, and any contact between the objects will be lost. The Earth, the solar system, the Milky Way, and our supercluster will be mutually observable, whereas the rest of the universe will receive in the distance. There may be hypothetical worlds beyond the regions observable to us. They originate as a result of phase transitions of physical vacuum. Alternatively, there may be objects forming out of irregularities of relic radiation located closest to the particle horizon. The question of multiverse objects remains a bone of contention among scientists, prompting an overwhelming number of pseudoscientific guesses. Be it as it may, most researchers see eye to eye as to the infinity of our universe although they interpret it in different ways. Some of them claim our world to be multidimensional, which makes our three-dimensional universe merely one of its layers. Others are inclined to believe in the theory of a multi-universe, with us as a minuscule fraction of an infinite multitude. Whereas there may be a portal to other worlds beyond the observable area of the universe, some space theories involve the existence of the so-called event horizon. According to this concept, we're never going to be able to look beyond the event horizon because the speed at which photons travel away from us will be higher than the speed with which the observable universe expands. According to this theory, all the galaxies surrounding us are bound to recede beyond the event horizon. It will look like time stopped in them. We will observe them infinitely receding beyond the observable boundaries, but never quite disappearing from view. Via as it may, contemporary science cannot provide a definite answer to this question, although the situation may change overnight once we have developed more advanced observation equipment. The universe might turn out to be a sort of sphere, and traveling over it might remind one of traveling on the spherical surface of our Earth. Considering the scale it reaches, however, this prospect appears impossible. In order to reach the edge of the observable universe, it would take man 46 billion years even if we travel at the speed of light. By the time we reach this designated point, it would have moved the same distance away, and a similar journey would have to be embarked upon. It is likely that there aren't any large objects beyond the observable universe, and on peering there, we would see just a homogeneous cloud of helium, hydrogen, and a few other elements. However, we might probably never be able to discover the origins of our world, and might forever remain in the position of someone chasing the horizon. What we have just covered is only a tiny part of the vast expanses of space. It may take humans more than one millennium to explore the rest of it. However, with the rapidity of the pace at which science strides forward, it is safe to say that every scientific breakthrough will exponentially facilitate our progress. And who knows, sooner or later, we might get to the point when the universe will be explored with the same precision as the surface of our own planet.